There we go. Okay. Um, so, Tanzanina Kaniput, Wampus Kamikus Kamikwanapio. Many blessings to all my relations in the four directions. Uh, this is a special segment uh, of Standing Bear Network. Um, I have with me uh, a man, you know, who's, uh, whose work has uh, in many ways overlapped my own uh, with respect to um, full screen solutions. Uh, I'd like to first, uh, just to give a backdrop, uh, I'd like to um, share a quote uh, from Chris Hedges, uh, who's the uh, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist uh, and author of America, uh, The Farewell Tour. And uh, in regard to the book, uh, Bright Green Lies, uh, Chris has written for more, uh, let's see, uh, Bright, Green, uh, Bright Green Lies exposes the hypocrisy and bankruptcy of uh, leading environmentalist groups uh, and the most prominent cheerleaders. It asks the question uh, most refused to ask. And in that questioning, that seeking uh, uncovers profound truths we ignore at our peril. So with that, uh, it's an honor to share uh, space with you, Max. Uh, I know you've done so much uh, work, uh, of course, in Paiute Shoshone territory with respect to the lithium mining going on out there, uh, you know, drawing uh, awareness and attention to, you know, what's been, uh, been going on with our hydro impacted communities, uh, mine as well, uh, in Pemichi Kamek territory. Uh, I would do you, uh, a great injustice to introduce you. So could you just tell us first, maybe a little bit about yourself and, uh, and, and, and a little bit more about uh, Bright Green Lies. Sure, John, thank you. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you fine. Can you I'm guys- actually, I'm out at Thacker Pass right now. So I'm, uh, I'm parked um, oh. out on the land here. Uh, so I'm, I'm using a hotspot. Terrific. Um, but no, I don't think you'd do me an injustice by introducing me. I'm just a, I'm just a guy. I don't want to give anyone a false impression that I'm anything that I'm not. I'm just a guy who, you know, like so many of us, I started learning about these issues when I was young, about environmental issues, the destruction of the planet, you know, different injustices. And I got really concerned about them. And then as I became a teenager, you know, I started to feel like, why, why aren't people taking this seriously? You know, why aren't people taking action? I think a lot of people have that, have been through that phase of like, it's a, it's a real like disconnect, you know, yeah. it's a, it's a cognitive dissonance, you know, between knowing the reality that we're in a crisis and then seeing everyone just go about their business, like everything's fine. Um, so I, I, I got involved more seriously in the environmental movement when I was around 20 years old and um, did some work with climate scientists, documenting climate science, and got involved in some pipeline blockades, some indigenous solidarity work, um, helped a little bit in the fight against the uh, water grab, the Las Vegas water grab in Eastern Nevada, and the fight against the Utah tar sands project down there. Um, helped a little bit in the fight against coal export terminals uh, in the Pacific Northwest, which is, I grew up in Seattle. So uh, that's, you know, that's, that's my, my home out there. And I, I, I love the Great Basin, you know, so I guess to, to segue to the book and Bright Green Lies, I used to believe that solar and wind and electric cars and, you know, these type of things were going to save the world. I really believed that because that's what everyone was telling me. That's what the articles said. That's what the videos said. Um, and I was really worried about global warming. So I thought, okay, let's, let's go for it. This sounds great. And then I was very blessed and lucky to, to be exposed to some environmentalists who were deeper thinkers <laughs> and who understood that, you know, these technologies don't just grow on trees. They come out of industrial supply chains and if you investigate those supply chains, where the materials come from, right. it's pretty bad, usually. <laughs> um, and that led to uh, starting to write this book, Bright Green Lies, in uh, 2015, I believe. Yeah. And it took uh, 
uh, five or six years to finish it and get it out there. And it was published last year. Wow. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, that's terrific. So it's, it's funny when I, when I think about my journey, uh, in many ways, it began. The reason why I read from Chris Hedges is because, in many ways, he began my journey uh, to sort of nudge me uh, to Standing Rock. And I think his line was, uh, you know, any type of, uh, you know, to be a successful uh, resistance, it has to be sustained re resistance. And he said, get out there, do whatever you can, even if it's bringing the coffee, you know. And with that, that was like my first journey to Standing Rock, uh, where I met people like uh, LaDonna Allard, you know, mentors and friends, and, and of course, um, Myron Dewey, uh, who's, who's from uh, Pirate Shoshone territory. And um, the reason why it's uh, exciting for me to talk to you about this is because that, that was a, it was a significant time in my life. Um, my, for people watching, Myron Dewey uh, was the founder of Digital Smoke Signals. Uh, very, um, he, he was the prominent media figure, you know, who really, he, he was able to get out what was happening by way of drones and uh, drone security for, for the people in the camps, elevating indigenous voices to indigenous eyes and, and encouraging youth to uh, get involved in media. So anyway, um, you know, My Myron, uh, he was killed uh, back in September, September uh, uh, 20, 26th. I'll never forget it was the day before my birthday and uh, people were crushed you know and I went out there and uh, you know I spent some 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 time out there you know at Pihimaha out in the desert and uh, you know it was uh, it was there that I think I I really began to understand um, the impact because when you learn from people on the ground the community members and for people who whose traditional lives are so significant um, so, and I've also seen you do, a, 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 I think I saw you do at least one feed with Myron. Um, and um, I think this is an example of allied and indigenous people coming together in a good way. And uh, I, I'm so grateful uh, for your presence and, uh, and for your work. Uh, just to, I don't wanna take up this conversation, but it, it evokes so many things. Oh, good. Working up here, you know, we've been doing the short documentaries, uh, one of which is uh, resource ex extraction in Wampanoag territory, and it has to do with all the aggregate removal. And what they're doing is they're putting up ground mounted solar panels, you know, they're stripping um, pristine um, forests. It's only one of three uh, Atlantic coastal pine barren forests in the world. And, uh, you know, what they do is they go in and they strip the hills, remove the sand in aggregate. Um, and then, uh, and of course they get subsidies for this because they're installing, uh, these ground mounted solar panels, huge, vast, you could see it from Google earth. I mean, just the changes in the forestry. Um, and, uh, but this, these types of developments are being accelerated, particularly under the, uh, liberal, uh, administration of George, uh, uh Joe Biden. And, um, in, in, in the race uh, to, um, you know, to, to reduce our carbon footprint. So what people think are really good um, is having devastating impacts. I might talk a little bit about Pemichi Quebec territory and hydro, but let me let, me let you just jump in and, and uh, take over wherever you want. Well, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm glad, I'm glad to hear you talk about this and tell the stories. Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting because you see this sort of bright green lies, the same techniques used in different areas. And it was a different area than that, that I actually first heard about Myron Dewey and got in touch with him. It was when I was living in Salt Lake City and I started to become aware that uh, the pinion pine and juniper forests you know, a lot of people call them cedar, the junipers, uh, cedar and the pinion pine is like the, the pine nuts were the staple food traditionally for so many of the Great Basin indigenous people, like as central as the buffalo were to the plains cultures is how I've heard it described. Right. And so people still pick pine nuts uh, pretty regularly. You know, some of my friends in different parts of Nevada, native friends, uh, 
pick pine nuts regularly. And uh, that issue, a lot of it is about the sage grouse. So basically after World War II, there was this big population boom explosion, you know, the, the baby boomers and they needed to feed, you know, millions and millions of new people in this country. So uh, the, the Bureau of Land Management at that time was called the uh, grazing service. And they would go out with bulldozers and all this heavy equipment left over from the war. And they would just bulldoze the sagebrush and the pinion pine and the juniper forest. And then they would plant it with grasses and then they would put cattle on it. Right. And that gradually sort of became politically unacceptable to do that as environmental consciousness grew. And at the same time, a different issue arose, which was this, the sage grouse, you know, this species of bird who lives in the Great Basin and they, uh, they're like 98% gone. So they're really on their way out. There are only about 200,000 of them left. And uh, back around 2012, the issue was very, it came to a head because on the one hand, you had all these environmental groups, all these you know traditionally minded indigenous folks, all these people who were oriented towards the birds and saving them, you know, this really iconic species. Um, and then on the other hand, you had all the moneyed interests, the ranchers, the oil and gas industry, the urban sprawl developers, the military in some cases, uh, who did not want that bird to get listed under the Endangered Species Act, because if it got listed, you'd have to stop a lot of that, that money making, <laughs> you know, and so instead of the bird being listed, they came to this compromise where they came up with a, a sage grouse management plan. And they basically said, okay, instead of making an endangered species, we've got this great plan, we got everyone on board, we're going to help the sage grouse. And that plan is now the justification circling back for cutting down huge amounts of pinion pine and juniper forests across Nevada and Utah and Colorado and Wyoming and Idaho and Oregon and uh, parts of Eastern California, all throughout the Great Basin and the Intermountain West. Uh, millions of acres of these pinion pine and juniper forests, native trees, like native biodiverse forests, in some cases, trees hundreds of years old, uh, being cut down, and they're saying it's restoration because right. they're, they're trying to restore habitat for the sage grouse. And to me, you know, it, it reminds me another example of this is like, you know, you were talking about hydro, uh, you know, on the Columbia River and on the Willamette River, where there are these big hydro dams, uh, the endangered salmon species come up and they all gather at the bottom of the dam because they're just hammering their heads on it. They can't get past it. And they're right. trying to get home and, and, and breed. You know, they're trying to fulfill their life cycle right. and this concrete barriers in front of them. So they just gather there. And so what's happened is all these sea lions have learned that they can swim upstream into the fresh water and gather below these dams and eat a bunch of salmon because they're all concentrated there. So it's right. easy fishing for the sea lions. And of course, any reasonable person would say, okay, the problem here is the dams, right? right. But, you know, there's a lot of economic interest behind those dams, you know, not just the hydropower, but uh, irrigation for industrial farming and, you know, flood control because, you know, they built all these cities and houses and stuff in the in the in the floodplains of these rivers, which was a stupid idea in the first place. Right. Um, so, they what do they do? They blame the the sea lions, and you have you know Fish and Wildlife Service going out there with rifles and shooting the sea lions to try and keep their populations down and keep them from eating the salmon. It's this displacement, you know, this sort of uh, uh, toxic attempt to address a problem you right. know and not and not actually get to the root of it and i think that's really a similar thing to what we're seeing with um with you know the the lithium mining the the solar sprawl that you're talking about right. um, and um yeah and you mentioned you know you mentioned aggregate mining sand and gravel and so on you know a lot of people don't know after water that's the substance that is extracted from the earth the most 
more than anything else. So water's first, huge amounts of water sucked up, mostly for industrial agriculture and cooling power plants and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and then number two after water is sand and gravel and aggregate. And there are, you know, that, that mining is really intense. There are whole islands that have disappeared uh, because they've been mined out of existence. You know, there are rivers who have been destroyed. There are uh, species who have been driven extinct right. because of mining for sand and gravel. And uh, it's, it's pretty brutal. And a lot of people don't think of it because it's, you know, you don't, you don't pour sand in your gas tank and then burn it and it belches out pollution. At least you don't pour sand in your friend's gas tank. <laughs> Maybe you do at the uh, construction site for the lithium mine or some other place, but, yeah. but uh, you know, it doesn't, it, it doesn't sort of conjure that image of environmental destruction for people, but it's incredibly destructive. Um, so that's I'm, right. I'm sorry it, y'all are facing that. <clears throat> if I could just interject, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, in Wampanoag territory, uh, this is what's going on is they are removing the sand. Uh, and uh, people don't realize that, you know, sand is for uh, infrastructure, you know, it's for concrete. And right now there is a there's a global shortage on sand. So when you have corporations now going into uh, urban centers and communities like Wampanoag territory, which was first contact, and they go in, uh, you know, just imagine that, uh, you know, these these hills that were covered with topsoil and those pine barren trees within within those, uh, you know, the the recesses are what's known as vernal pools, which many consider to be the genesis of life. Um, they they have been uh, accelerating uh, their their operations, particularly under the under the uh, cloak of covid. And uh, there's people are really up in arms, uh, you know, but the, you know, Wampanoag tribal communities have come together in a good way with allies uh, and, and go uh, check out uh, um, Pine Barrens Alliance folks. But when I discussed some of these things with Myron, right, we were going to talk about it, Myron and I, about the connection between what was going on in Wampanoag territory and what was going on uh, in Paiute Shoshone territory where the mining of that lithium was occurring. Uh, I don't think people tend, tend to make the connection, uh, for example, the hydroelectric, when we flick that switch, uh, it, you know, if that money is coming from hydro corridors, we are contributing to the cultural genocide of indigenous people. Um, when we, uh, you know, go en masse, you know, to, um, you know, to, to strip carbon sequestering forests for these enormous uh, ground mounted solar uh, complexes, we are contributing to the cultural genocide of indigenous people. Um, we have a real energy problem, maybe an energy consumption problem. And I think there's a big disconnect, you know, because for indigenous people, we looked at things in a circle. You know, everything was connected to everything else, right? The web of life. Um, you talk about the seals and the salmon, uh, you know, that's hyper-focusing uh, on, on, uh, on a consequence of a dam and coming up with a solution that doesn't, you know, uh, take, take so many of these things uh, uh, into consideration. Uh, you know, this, this uh, relationship that we have not only with one another, but with our environment and with the trees and with the water and we're, you know, and it and it affects us in terms of gathering our medicines and uh, digging up sacred burial sites. In uh, in in Paiute Shoshone territory, uh, and I'm glad you brought up the 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 dewatering. People don't realize how much water is used, and how it depletes aquifers. And to do such a thing to an already impoverished community, in the middle of a desert. I had to get that off my chest. Thanks. Thanks, Max. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's, it's crazy. I'm out here right now. I'm actually uh, parked right now at uh, Sentinel Rock, which is the uh, September 12th, 1865 massacre that took place was right down here about half a mile or a quarter mile from where I'm parked. 
And um, that event was part of the opening up of the West for colonization. And that colonization, I think, was largely economic in character. You know, I think uh, uh, if you look at history, historians who really study the development of systems like racism and ideologies like racism, you know, uh, generally say that uh, there's an economic exploitation that one group wants to dominate another. And then they develop an ideology to support that and to justify it, you know? And I think, I think people are generally good. Like we want to treat each other well, mostly, you know, we want to do good by each other. But so in order to commit a massacre like this, you need to develop, you know, quote unquote, need to develop this ideology of manifest destiny, for example, you know, in this case. And it's, it, it, it does go across so many areas. And that's why in Bright Green Lies, we tried to uh, discuss a lot of different issues. You know, we hit the big, the big three or four, which are, you know, solar, wind, electric vehicles, hydro, but we also try to talk about things like the electric grid itself. Most people don't think about the electric grid at all. It's kind of this invisible thing. There's power lines right here in front of me. Um, but the, the electric grid is considered the largest machine ever built on the planet. And if you think about the millions of miles of power lines around the planet, uh, you've probably seen you know, the, the clear cut swaths through a forest for a transmission line. Uh, you've, what people may not know is that those, once they clear cut those areas, they maintain them by spraying uh, pesticides. So uh, often from helicopters, sometimes on foot as well. Um, then you can go into the materials that go into the electric grid, the millions or billions of tons of, of steel and aluminum and copper and other materials. You know, I used to live in Salt Lake City and the largest copper mine in the world is the uh, Rio Tinto Kennecott mine right outside of, of Salt Lake. It was only about 10 miles from my house. And it's a mountaintop removal mine. I mean, this is no different from mountaintop removal coal mining in Appalachia, you know, in West Virginia or where else. And there's, there's a mountain missing. <laughs> An entire mountain is gone. You know, it's basically been inverted. It used to be like this, and now it's like this uh, for this copper mine. And the amount of pollution that's been pumped out by that mine continuously for 100 years is insane. You know, there's a giant plume of polluted groundwater leaching into the Jordan River, which is already this extremely polluted, degraded river uh, that's then draining into uh, the salt, Great Salt Lake. You know, so ultimately all this pollution is ending up in the Great Salt Lake, which is one of the most important migratory bird habitats on the entire continent. <laughs> and, uh, the, you know, the air pollution from that mine, it's the number one source of air pollution in a valley that has two oil refineries and several million residents driving cars and the intersection of two major interstates. And that mine is the number one source of air pollution over, uh, over the oil refineries, over all the cars, over the freeways. Um, and Salt Lake City has the worst winter air quality in the country. Right. And there are, uh, it, it, that air kills people. <laughs> I lived there for a couple of winters and it was, it was not nice. You know, I have pretty healthy lungs, but I think, uh, I, I think I'm still feeling the impacts from that. And I haven't lived there in, you know, eight or nine years at this point, but I really do think it caused some serious damage to my lungs just to be there in the winter. Um, right. You know, and, and then imagine if you're not a human, but you're a deer or a cougar or a, a, a duck or a fish living in one of those rivers, you know, you can't get away from that pollution. You're not there for just you know, a small fraction of your life, and then you move away, you're not, 
able to leave town when the air pollution gets so bad, people literally like flee and leave town if they can afford it to get away from the air pollution. You know, the, the wildlife can't, can't do that necessarily. They're stuck with it. And uh, so it's, it's, you know, it's the electric grid, it's this gravel mining, it's the clear cut logging, uh, it's the industrial fishing. All of them are really reflective of this egoic mind, you know, and this, you know, ego is important when we're kids, you know, we, we need ego. We need to develop a sense of self and who we are and our identity and what matters to us. And, but you're meant to move beyond it, you know, <laughs> by the time you're, you know, 12, 14, 18, somewhere in there, you know, you're meant to gradually move through it and, you know, have your rites of passage or whatever it is and, and grow up, you know, and become an adult and recognize that it's not all about me. You know, it's about us. It's about family. It's about community. It's about future generations, you know, and I, that's something that I've been very humbled with doing the work here at Pahimaha, Thacker Pass is, you know, meeting a lot of elders and different people who, the way I look at it is like the adults, you know, the kids are focused on themselves. They need to be, you know, the adults focus more on community and family and, and the group and so on. And the, the elders really move on to the whole next phase, which is like, how do we have right relationship with the more than human, you know, with the land, with the cosmos, with spirit, with future generations, with ancestors, you know, and that the the mainstream dominant culture in the society is stuck in that adolescent phase right and it's not even like a healthy adolescence because i know a lot of 12 year olds who are a lot smarter and you know more mentally and spiritually healthy than somebody like elon musk or joe biden is <laughs> unfortunately so you know this is a recur a reoccurring theme uh this uh, resource extraction and uh you know, of course, I have many of uh, the communities in Canada, um, uh, you know, have come to me and have talked to me about uh, some of the some of their challenges. And uh, what we've come to realize and we what we understand is that uh, this is um, this has to do with colonialism. Uh, it really does. This is uh, this goes back to first contact. Uh, you know, 1492, Columbus uh, landed in Taino territory, and then within 1493, uh, you know, the doctrine of discovery uh, and terra nullius were put into place, which meant that uh, the Europeans could come in and un unilaterally uh, take the land uh, from anybody that wasn't Christian or Catholic, uh, because they were animals, they were considered to be animals. And, uh, you know, and the Pope has never rescinded that doctrine. And uh, it's that doctrine which uh, informs uh, all aspects of uh, colonial policy, both uh, here in the United States and Canada, New Zealand, uh, of course, Great Britain, Australia. And, uh, and there have been Supreme Court rulings that have evoked uh, that racist uh, doctrine of dominance. But we see it manifesting itself over in Thacker Pass, where you where you are now, and um, you know, I just wanted to expand a little bit on Pihimaha, which is the camp where where you are, and um, so Pihimaha means rotten moon, and uh, it's it's a reference to the September twelfth, uh, eighteen sixty five massacre, which occurred there, of thirty one. Uh, uh, Shoshone Paiute men, women and children. And the reason why it's called Rotten Moon is because uh, they didn't just kill everybody, but their entrails were spread all across the desert. And, uh, and when, they, when they came and they saw what had been done, you know, that's how that, that day was named uh, as Rotten Moon. And that's, that's documented. There, were, there was another battle there uh, that was passed down by way, way of oral uh, tradition. And um, this doctrine of dominance, this, this, this uh, ability for corporations and government 
the machinery of, of bureaucracy to think that, that corporations should just, they can come in and unilaterally do what they want with the lands, with the waters, without consultation, without um, considering the consequences, uh, consequences of those uh, most heavily impacted communities, which are always indigenous communities, right? And it's the same thing in Pemichicamac territory, uh, North Central Manitoba, anywhere there's a hydro, hydro dam, right? We got um, the Site C Dam in BC. Uh, there's like nine dams along the Nelson River. We have the Romaine uh, Ford dams, um, Muscat Falls. What is going on? Um, you know, we've done short films on like keeping uh, hydro out of the Green New Deal and there's a lot of people that almost they would consider themselves allies, but what they're doing is they are like doubling down on uh, mining extraction and um, hydro development uh, at the risk of making our people functionally extinct, Max. You know, the old saying, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Yeah. And it's true. You get you get a lot of people who really think that they're trying to save the planet. They're here to help solve global warming, to address these issues. But when it comes down to it, what their actions are actually doing is condemning places like this to destruction, right? condemning more of the land to destruction. And the way that I often think about it is, you know, if you go out into the area of this proposed mine here, and you talk to the sagebrush and you talk to the rabbits and the golden eagles and the sage grouse and the coyotes and the rattlesnakes and the grasshoppers and the black widow spiders and the sage sparrows and the foxes and the badgers and uh, the morning doves and the kill deer and the mule deer and the antelope and the bobcats and everyone else who lives here, <laughs> you know, the, the fence lizards, the, the uh, horny toads, the Pacific tree frogs, believe it or not, there are Pacific tree frogs live out here. I've heard them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if you talk to them and you ask them, is it good for the planet to destroy this place? For lithium you know what do you think they're going to say what do you think they're going to tell you and you know some people i know you'll understand that john but you know some people obviously don't even think that the natural world that non-human beings have have sentience have intelligence have feelings and thoughts and loves and hatreds and and struggles and fears just like we do you know so many people don't believe that just you know treat the natural world literally believe that a place like this is a wasteland full of nothing you know i listed off all those creatures who live here that's just a fraction those are just the ones who popped into my head who i who i can remember who i even know a name for you know right. that's that's uh that's a fraction of the life who's here and to me the real arrogance is the people who deny the intelligence and the volition of those creatures you know because those are our relatives, literally, you know, they're, they're quite literally our kin. You know, we are, we share the same DNA. We have, uh, we came from the same uh, web of life. You know, we came from the same place as them. So to assume that they're fundamentally different from us in these different ways, that to me is the real arrogance. And I think if you talk to all of them, they'd say, no, don't, don't destroy our home. We don't want you to do this. Right. And that, that's the thing, you know, I, I was really influenced um, back around. Um, it was boy, 10 years ago, almost. I helped organize an event and chief Kayleen Sisk came out for it. She's the chief of the Winnemum Wintu tribe, which is sort of in Northern California. And they're not federally recognized. So they've been struggling with that. They've been trying to bring back their salmon. Their salmon, the, the specific population of salmon who lives in the river there, 
were wiped out by a dam. But before they were wiped out, some of those salmon were transported to New Zealand and planted in these streams in New Zealand like as sport fish. And so they've been doing this whole fight where they went to New Zealand and they got the, they got some of the babies of these salmon who are their fish, their relatives, who they have lived with for so long and they brought them back and they're working to try and reestablish them. Um, so pretty amazing. But uh, Kayleen Sisk, Chief Kayleen Sisk is, is an amazing woman and she said something in the middle of a talk, it was just a one-off comment where she said, you know, people forget that electricity is a convenience because she didn't grow up with electricity. You know, she grew up not even on a reservation because they don't have land. They're not federally recognized. So, but she grew up, you know, in this community, she didn't have electricity. And um, that's the thing is that ultimately we're asking all of those creatures, all of those life forms to sacrifice, not just their lives right now but their children and their grandchildren and great-grandchildren and generations of their ability to exist destroyed for things that are not necessary <laughs> you know for phones and xbox controllers and uh electric cars and these things that are they may be fun they may be enjoyable you know they're 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 ubiquitous and we sort of make them necessary by the way we live but fundamentally they're not really that important for human beings at all you know and i think people who really are wise and understand what life is all about know that it's not about accumulation and wealth and material goods you know it's about we're, we're only here for a limited time and it's about our experience and how well we relate to each other and how we, um, the marks that we leave in the world and the impact that we have on our children or, you know, maybe we don't have kids, our nieces and nephews, our cousins, our friends, you know, it's about um, our relationship with the land and, uh, and you know, the, these are the things that really matter. Nobody on their deathbed is like, damn, I wish I'd bought more, you know, <laughs> I wish I'd bought more of this thing, you know. Right. Nobody's thinking about that when they're dying. They're thinking about their family and, you know, the way they've spent their time and their relationships and so on. You know, they're thinking about those things that are really important. And yes, we need the necessities of life to survive. And in, that, in this modern world, that means money. And so, so many people end up sacrificing for money. But, you know, that's an artificial system that's been imposed on us, um, you know, and it's really been imposed deliberately. We're talking about colonization. You know, I come, I'm a uh, large chunk of my heritage is Irish. And, you know, the, the, the colonization of Ireland was really used as a model for the colonization of, of uh, this continent, uh, the British colonized Ireland for 500 years, you know, and before they, before they, long before they came out here and they were brutal. They did the exact same things in terms of, you know, destroying the culture and banning the language and getting all the kids in, in, you know, essentially boarding schools and trying to destroy the culture at that fundamental level. And it's completely taking away political power. And let me and, just interject. There was a mass grave of 800 uh, ch children that was found in Ireland. Yeah. In, you know, yeah. In, in a, yeah. a Catholic, I think it was a Catholic uh, boarding school of some kind. But. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's hard because, you know, the reality is, I think that the dominant culture, the dominant way of life, Western civilization, um, whatever you want to call it, whatever terms you want to use for it, the culture of empire, it's a really, it's a maladaptive strategy. You know, if you're talking about survival of a species on the planet, you don't survive by, you know, conquering everyone else and destroying all the life around you because then you starve and the wells go dry and your soil becomes infertile. And this has happened again and again to different civilizations around the world. You survive by fitting in with the other life <laughs> you survive by building good relationships with the other life by 
uh, working with the natural world, not against the natural world, and understanding that we're part of it. Um, but the problem is that the dominant strategy is militarily effective in the short term. You know, you get uh, these societies like uh, uh, like Western civilization, like the United States of America, that you know produced hundreds of thousands and then millions of people and these giant standing armies and you know cannons and muskets and repeating rifles and all this stuff and it you know and people who don't destroy the land in order to create those technologies uh have a hard time militarily fighting back against that um right you know it's it's uh <coughs> that's sort of one of the conundrums that we're facing is that we're we tend to be the people who are nice and generous and kind <laughs> and want to take care of each other and take care of the land right. and when not just bullies but profoundly abusive people and sociopaths come in they're willing to take advantage of people like us right. and um how do you deal with that you know it's a big problem it's a big one now, uh, somebody who uh, popped up a question regarding um, uh, these renew so-called renewable energies. Uh, well, it's better than coal, they said. Uh, you know, these uh, coal coal-fired power plants. Um, I'm I want to throw in my two cents, and then I'll let you throw in yours. Um, in in Pemichicamac territory, my, my, my territory, which is very impoverished, you know, there are third world conditions there. This is uh, what's going on there uh, is happening uh, uh, under the watch of uh, the Provincial Crown Corporation, Manitoba Hydro. Um, you know, there was uh, what was known as the Northern Flood Agreement. Uh, I think it was uh, September 16th, 1977. And um, they built this hydro dam, and, and they and in this agreement they said that uh, they promised to era they promised to eradicate impoverishment on the reservation. Um, one of the representatives held held up a pen and said, "Should the waters, you know, should the waters exceed the height of a pen, they would be compensated." Um, you know, since that time, uh, what happens, first of all, is they need the reservoirs. And these reservoirs wind up flooding vegetation uh, and all kinds of uh, methylmercury uh, and CO2 are released into the atmosphere. And I don't, I don't know how many people know that, uh, you know, methane is many times the, uh, uh, the greenhouse gas of CO2. And then methylmercury in the waters as a result of the uh, decomposition of the organic material. Uh, it's cumulative. It's it builds up in the food chain. It's in you know, and our people survive by way of hunting, fishing, and trapping. And uh, so a lot of people are are sick. Uh, and this is uh, you know part of the, and of course it affects the the migratory uh, season seasons with the hunting and the fishing for the animals. Uh, the fluctuation of the water has been eroding the islands, right? The islands have been disappearing. Uh, I don't think people, I think we need to empathically get people to understand and realize how this is, you know, contributing uh, to the to the cultural genocide of, uh, of, you know, of people who've been here since time immemorial. And uh, our Kisamen, uh, our holy man, uh, we don't say chiefs, you know, we say Kisamen. Um, you know, he's told us he's seen entire communities disappear. And, uh, you know, when I see the stripping of carbon sequestering forests and all of these things are being monetized and incentivized and, uh, and all of these subsidies are being given uh, to these, we're talking about billions and billions there's going to be no end to the aggregate removal with all of the, um, you know, all of the infrastructures that are, you know, being developed all over the world. Uh, do you like to add to that, Max? 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think, you know, to me, the, the bottom line is that, <laughs> you know, it's like that old political slogan, that's not change, that's more of the same, hmm. right? <laughs> that's really what we're seeing in these situations. We're seeing native communities and poor communities and rural communities that's right. paying the price, right? That's not change, that's more of the same. We're seeing the natural world bulldozed and fragmented and blown up uh, for these, you know, just down here in Southern Nevada, you've got a giant solar project going into Yellow Pine Solar Project. They're building it right now and they're bulldozing desert tortoise habitat. That's a, that's a threatened species. It's listed under the Endangered Species Act and their habitat is being destroyed for energy development, right? Now, if somebody told you the exact same thing, their habitat is being destroyed for oil drilling, almost pretty much every single environmentalist, every single person who's concerned about global warming, about all these issues would be against it. But for some reason, when it's the exact same situation, but it's solar energy, a lot of people say, oh, now I'm for it. We've yeah. become CO2 reductionists. You know, we become so focused on climate change that we've forgotten that global warming isn't even the most serious environmental crisis we're facing. The yes. biodiversity collapse is the most serious environmental crisis, along with you know, the release of, of toxic chemicals, unknown chemicals into the soil, the air, the water, our bodies are full of them. I mean, when a, when a, a woman breastfeeds her baby these days, that baby is getting industrial toxins you know, that didn't, did not exist prior to being synthesized in laboratories and factories in her breast milk going directly into that baby i'm you know i'm not saying breastfeeding is bad because formula is terrible <laughs> you know well it so you're formula, talking about development I'll, I'll, years. Yeah, I'll reframe that you know yeah. some people have to use formula but um yeah. you know those companies like nestle are awful very abusive and breastfeeding is definitely the most healthy way to take care of your baby if you can do it but you know then you've got the dead zones in the ocean. You've got ocean acidification. You've got the drawdown of the aquifers. You've got uh, the collapse of pollination in insect populations. Then you've got the collapse of plankton populations in the ocean. Plankton, two, third, two out of every three breaths that we take are because of plankton. You know, you, we should be praying to plankton every day. <laughs> We should be his life. Those, you know, those, those gods of the ocean, those microscopic gods who make life possible for us, you know, That's right. we really, we owe them everything and they're collapsing. Uh, and, you know, global warming is a huge, massive problem. You know, I've actually, I've been to the Arctic. I've walked on thawing permafrost. I've seen forests falling over because they're collapsing. You know, I've, I've experienced the same summers and heat waves that all of you have. And it's brutal and it's terrifying. But the thing is, when we're scared, we're easy to manipulate. Yeah. You know, that's the, if people have ever heard of Naomi Klein and her book, The Shock Doctrine, that was her core idea in that book was that in times of crisis and emergency and when people are scared, corporations manipulate us right. because we're very easy to uh, take advantage of in those situations. And that's what we're seeing with global warming. We're seeing a very real crisis being exploited for money. You know, the green in green energy is money. It's not the planet. It's not the plants because the plants are getting bulldozed for the green energy. They're getting squashed and crushed and pushed aside. The green is the money, right? It's, there are trillions of dollars at stake here, literally trillions of dollars in this green energy transition. And there are, corporations are foaming at the mouth for that money right now. There is so much money up for grabs and you're seeing huge government subsidies move to these, you know, green energy projects. And, you know, I'm against subsidizing green energy. I'm also against subsidizing fossil fuels. You know, I'm against subsidizing anything that destroys the planet. In fact, I think that, you know, we need to be subsidizing restoration and, people living simpler lives and moving back into better relationship with the earth and reducing consumption and, uh, you know, stabilizing growth and then getting to negative growth. That's what we should be subsidizing. That's what we should be putting 
our tax money towards, not destroying more habitat, you know? So the other, I'm, I'm just rambling on this one, but it's a really yeah. important question. I'm glad whoever asked this question, I'm very glad. I hope you're still watching. Um, I'm very glad because it's, it's really such an important question. Um, these projects pump out a lot of greenhouse gases, right? So, okay, you may be saying from a carbon perspective, from a greenhouse gas perspective, if a coal mine is way up here, then maybe a, a lithium mine is only down here, right? But where we need to be is actually down here. <laughs> so these things are not good for the planet. They're not even really a step in the right direction. You know, it's, it's really like comparing a gunshot wound to the planet to a stab wound. You know, which would you rather have? It's like, okay, I guess I'd rather have a stab wound, but really I don't want either. Like either one is going to kill me. Either one is a life-threatening wound, right? And that's the situation we're in here. So the other thing, of course, is that these projects are dependent on fossil fuels. You know, like I just said, this Thacker Pass lithium mine, if people have ever been to New York City, if you've seen the Empire State Building, right? If you've stood under that building, it's massive, right? I haven't been there since I was a tiny little kid. I was over there one time. My dad's family's from out there. And so the Empire State Building, imagine two Empire State Buildings. That's how much sulfur needs to be trucked in every single year for this lithium mine if they build it. And that sulfur comes from oil refineries. And especially it comes from the tar sands because the tar sands, uh, it's a very high sulfur product and they pull the sulfur at the oil refinery. They, they pull it, they remove the sulfur from the oil um, because if they leave it in there, that creates acid rain, you know? And so there were laws put in place a couple of decades ago that you have to remove the sulfur from oil to, uh, to reduce acid rain issues. So um, that sulfur has been piling up at these oil refineries and a way that these oil companies can make a bit of extra money is by selling sulfur to places like this lithium mine. So the lithium that's produced here that goes into electric vehicles and so on, all those dollars will be directly, some of that money will be directly flowing to oil companies and will make the economics of tar sands oil extraction more profitable, right? So, I mean, the carbon emissions from this one mine would be like the, the equivalent to a small city. It's, it's a lot. It's a lot of pollution. It's not good for the planet. It's really bad for the planet. <laughs> um, and I guess the final, and again, you know, that's not change. That's more of the same. And the final thing I would say about this is that a lot of us feel like we're in a double bind. You know, we feel like it's either fossil fuels, which really suck and lead to a climate apocalypse and so many human rights issues and all kinds of stuff, right? Or it's renewables, which may also have problems, but hopefully they'll be less. Hopefully they won't be as big of a deal, right? That's how people are looking at this. But the reality is we can choose neither of those. We can choose to reject both of those destructive things. We can, you know, it's like, uh, we're so addicted to energy in this culture, but we don't need, we certainly don't need this level of energy that we have, that we've become used to. I mean, the average person today has so much energy available to them. It's like a, it's like a emperor, you know, a thousand years ago, literally, like you can buy a product and have it delivered to your door, you know, in 24 hours. It's unbelievable amounts of energy at our beck and call, even poor people in this country, you know? And for the ultra wealthy, it's like stratospheric, unbelievable, you know, insane um, and very um, obscene amounts of energy available to them. So we could all live with a lot less energy and still have all our basic necessities met and, um, and reduce our impact on the planet. But I think, you know, like Chief Kayleen Sisk said, electricity is a convenience. And we have become dependent on it in a lot of ways, but our ancestors lived without it and they did fine. In fact, they did a lot better than us in a lot of ways. You know, it's, 
the rates of, of anxiety and depression and, and suicide and mental health issues, plus all the physical health issues in this culture, diabetes, and cancer, and heart disease. They call those things diseases of civilization. Literally, you know, the, science, the doctors, I'm not making that name up, the doctors call those diseases of civilization because outside of civilization, you don't get those. They don't happen. <laughs> and I, I think that, you know, if you're in a double bind where it's fossil fuels and it's renewables and they both seem like bad options, the only way out of that double bind is to smash the whole thing and just reject it, reject it. You know, Max, I see colonialism as this kind of uh, traveling esophagus, you know, consuming everything in its path. And uh, what you said earlier, you know, it, it struck me and you were talking about the animals. And uh, of course, for indigenous people, you know, we were governed by the laws of creator and um, our government, we're, we're the animals, you know, we're the trees. Our universities was the dome of the sky and beyond, you know, in every, in every tree. 10,000 teachings in every blade of grass, in every shiny pine needle. And uh, when you th talk about throwing ecology off, we're talking about relationships, you know? We're talking about the relationships that everything has to everybody else. And uh, I think that uh, I don't think this is. I don't think this is an economic disaster, uh, crisis, or even a um, an environmental crisis. I think this is a spiritual crisis, and for me, I think it's a matter of us bringing the I-Thou relationship uh, back to all of life, the way Indigenous people had it for all the world. And when this resonates from the grassroots to the global community, you know, maybe we can come down like a pair of pliers on all of this stuff, because in between all of these legislative changes and it's like you, you can shuffle things around all you want and do all kinds of hocus pocus, you know, with calculating, you know, carbon molecules and offsets and trading and all of this stuff. But you know what, I've been there. I've been to these capped off mercury mines, uh, you know, I, 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 Dale, uh, or day has shown me uh, quite a bit of, uh, um, you know, so, some of the areas that were capped off and they're now Superfund sites talking about uh, the particulate matter, right? I mean, that's a pass right there, Thacker's Pass, right? So the trade winds must blow through there, carrying all of that uh, particulate matter into the communities, those vulnerable communities. So I think... I think we're at a turning point and I think people are ready for this. I think they're starting to, maybe it started with, um, you know what, this is, it hasn't started with anything. It's really, it's been going on for a long time, but I think people are aware of the egregious, uh, egregious human rights violations that occur occurring, not just here on Turtle Island, but all, all across the world. You know, the extraction, the resource extra extraction, extraction is continuing. Uh, they're still mining for gold lithium, cobalt, nickel, obsidian, um, and um, yeah, it's like, um, I, I don't, it doesn't matter to, to me what, you know, who people look at as the higher power or, but if people could get in touch with, you know, the, the greatest thing in their life that helps to inform their conduct and their life and the choices that we make. You know, I think that's, I think that's where, I think that's recognizing the spiritual aspect. Uh, but, but we got a long way to go. That's for sure. Yeah, I think you're right, John. I think that's well said. And, and I think you're absolutely right about it being a, a spiritual crisis in so many ways. Um, you know, I, I know for me, and I imagine you can relate and probably a lot of people listening is that, you know, the most profound experiences of my life have been 
those sort of ego dissolving experiences or like barrier dissolving experiences, whether it's, you know, love, profound love with another human being or sort of a sublime experience in, in nature where it's just so beautiful and everything's so perfect that, you know, it's almost unbelievable that it's real or, um, or whether it's, you know, a spiritual experience of some sort of communication that you receive or message or something that, that doesn't feel like it originates in you. It's from some other force outside of you. You know, these, these, um, these experiences are really buried in the mainstream culture and they're looked down upon and they're treated as childish and stupid and, you know, romantic and silly and, you know, yeah. Uh, that is that is desecration you know that's the desecration of human experience you know which is that's almost every moment of our lives is human experience you know i think sometimes those barriers dissolve and um, but uh, that's the devaluing of what it is to be a human being and so i i really do think that in in so many ways the dominant culture has a death urge and a lot of people have written about this going back, you know, a long time, philosophers and thinkers and writers and, and just average people who just kind of perceive this death urge in the mainstream culture. You know, what else, what else could you call it when you destroy the land that supports you, but a death urge, you know, it's, it doesn't make any sense. It's not an intelligent thing to do. Um, and yet it seems like it's full steam ahead. So. I'm, I'm hopeful that we can potentially turn the ship around. I think we're in for some pretty dangerous and challenging times and um, things might get really rough in the future. They already, they already are depending on where you are and who you are and excuse me. But you know, if you, if you're living in Pakistan, you know, environmental collapse and social collapse isn't like a future thing it's happening every day i mean the same is true on a lot of reservation communities you know it's like collapse happened 500 years ago it's not you know it's not a future thing but you know for a lot of people in the mainstream of society in this country i think there's this way of life won't continue forever you know and and when it ends i would rather we had destroyed as few places as possible <laughs> because Ultimately, you know, we're, we're just like all the other animals out here. We're just like the bird I hear singing out here. Um, we need habitat. We need food, water. We need shelter. We need places to live. We need, uh, we need to exist. And we are destroying that. Um, well, not you and I, but, you know, the culture and certain people within the culture are destroying that. Um, that ability for the future to survive for, you know, ones and zeros in a bank account, you know, on some hard drive somewhere. Um, and that, if that's not the definition of insanity, I don't know what it is. Max, uh, can you give us uh, maybe a quick update uh, as to what's happening there in, in uh, Paiute Shoshone, uh, Shoshone territory? Uh, sure. Yeah. So we're running into the reality that the legal system uh, supports these projects. So this this fight has been in court for a while. Um, we there are four environmental groups suing the project, uh, suing to halt the project. There's a local rancher suing, and then two tribes: the Burns Paiute tribe and the Reno Sparks Indian Colony. Um, those lawsuits are nearing the end. We're expecting to have a final decision in those cases maybe in July. Um, and we'll see, but it's important everyone understand that the best case scenario in those lawsuits is a delay. The best case scenario is that the judge says, you didn't do your permitting right, you need to go back and do it correctly. Um, the, judge is, the judge can't legally say, no project ever, you can't do it there. Um, and she won't say that and she can't legally say that. So it's just important that people understand the courts are not going to save us. We can't rely on them. Um, and until there's some really fundamental changes in law, that's going to continue to be the case. You know, the courts are just one strategy. Um, so we're waiting to see what will happen there. Just uh, last week, archaeological digs began out here. 
um, at Backer Pass. Uh, the company is required to excavate artifacts. There are more than, there are 1,020 known um, cultural resource sites, as they call them, in Thacker Pass, um, including 57 that are very significant. That doesn't include the 1865 massacre site because they didn't even know about that until we told them about it, um, which shows you how thorough their research was, uh, not very. Um, the archaeological digs have just begun. As far as we can tell, they are just doing soil samples so far. They're actually not digging today. Um, I went around through the whole project area today, walked all over the place, observed from some high points and different areas, and there's no digging going on today. They Yesterday, I'm not sure if they dug. It was pretty wet all day. The day before that, I did observe them doing some digging. They dug a trench with a backhoe took some samples and then filled it back in. So I'm not sure if they were pulling out artifacts or soil samples. I was told that they might be doing uh, soil samples, but um, they're gonna, their plan is to dig up all the artifacts, put them in boxes and take them to a warehouse outside of Carson City. And that's how they mitigate the negative impacts on cultural resources. That's what they call it, um, you wow. know, a, a lot of, my, my native friends and folks who've been working with out here call it uh, looting, looting <laughs> or grave robbing. Um, you know, the, the 31 to 70 Paiute people who were massacred out here, they didn't, they weren't buried. You know, people ran for their lives. They were left on the ground. Um, so their remains are still here. And uh, they ran in all directions, as far as we can tell, but probably mostly west and northwest, which would... Uh, have them running from where they were camped directly into the mine site. Um, so BLM is pushing forward with the project. There's a lot of momentum behind it. It's a billion dollar corporation. Um, the government wants it, the state government wants it. And um, it's a real David, David versus Goliath situation out here. So um, we have some strategies up our sleeve, but we don't know what's going to happen i mean you saw at standing rock that you know despite tens of thousands of people organizing and mobilizing um it's damn hard to stop one of these projects um it's fundamentally legal to do this and if you try and stop it they will send armed men to uh move you out of the way in one way or another and in that sense, it's really what's happening is no different from what happened in 1865 when the, the soldiers came out here and and uh, massacred people who were in the way of progress, you know. Uh, what can you tell us about, I, I believe it's the uh, 1872 mining law uh, that was put into place. Yes. And, uh, and maybe we could trail that on to uh, Deb Holland's position. Um, you know, as uh, depart uh, head of the, uh, the, the Department of Interior. Yeah, so the 1872 mining law is basically the law that, um, that rules mining on public lands in the United States. So this is Bureau of Land Management land. It's federal land. Supposedly, you know, it's, that means it's mine and yours and everybody's. But uh, mostly it's the mining companies because <laughs> they get first dibs. That's basically what the mining law says, is mining is the most important thing that you can do on a public land. And if somebody wants to mine, the government will move heaven and earth, literally, to uh, make it possible for them to do so. So uh, that law was uh, created in the era of colonization, the first, you know, the first wave of colonization of this region, and it was... It was created to, um, to pull, to uh, facilitate mining, mostly silver and gold, especially, so that that could get shipped back to the East Coast, to the Treasury, um, because this was after the Civil War. There was a lot of rebuilding going on. The government needed money. They always need money. <laughs> and uh, so it was all about pulling this ore out of the ground. Ironically, you know, to cycle back to what we were talking about earlier, um, that first boom of, of gold and silver mining here in Nevada and into California and elsewhere, that is what 
uh, led to huge amounts of deforestation in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, because back in those days, um, they would smelt all the ore, you know, basically pulling rocks out of the ground that have a small component of gold in them. And they would melt that gold out of the rock with wood. They would, there are these huge kilns outside of uh, Ely, Nevada, for example, these giant, like uh, 40 foot tall ovens that they would pack full of wood and ore and they would melt the, the gold and the silver out of rock. Um, so huge deforestation for that. So, you know, mining has been an incredibly destructive activity for really thousands of years. I mean, there are mines from the Roman Empire that are thousands of years old that are still toxic, you know, to this day. Um, so these things, these things don't get better. So that mining law is a real problem. People have tried to change it for a long time, but it's the power of the lobbyists that the dollar speaks in our culture. And um, I mean, that's why for my part, I think uh, it's less likely we're gonna be able to change the situation by fixing a law like that than it is that we're going to like organize a revolution and overthrow the government or you know, take back control of, of the land for local people or you know, really have some fundamental revolutionary type change um, to our system. Um, you know, a lot of people say that the government is broken, the laws are broken, the system's broken. They're not broken. They're working exactly how they're intended to work. And that's why it's so hard to change them. That's why it's so hard to change the system from inside is because the system is set up to facilitate the destruction of the land and the exploitation of, of people. That's what it's meant to do. So when you try and fight that from the inside, you're fighting a lot of momentum. And that doesn't mean it's not worthwhile or or not possible in some cases, but it's really, really damn hard. <laughs> right. And, uh, you know, so for me, I'm, I'm more of the mind that we need to do it ourselves. We need direct action. We need revolutionary change. We need people's movements. We need grassroots movements. Um, we all need to stand up and become leaders on these issues. We all need to organize and fight for the land. And um, I think that's where our best chance lies. Wow. Well, you know, Max, I want to thank you uh, on behalf of my people, uh, Pemichikamak people uh, in Cross Lake Manitoba, uh, you know, uh, who are being, uh, you know, their lives have been devastated, you know, for quite some time now as a result of uh, the hydro dams. Um, I want to thank you on behalf of the communities um, in Wampanoag territory uh, and, you um, Pyot Shoshone territory, you've really, um, you've been an exemplary ally, you know, and it's, it's a beautiful thing. People can come together in a good way. And there is, there is a sense of urgency. Uh, this is affecting everybody. You know, originally what started to just be an indigenous problem, you know, now this is reaching rural, uh, not just rural, but urban communities, communities, uh, you know, with $750,000 homes you know, now they're overlooking a, a solar field, you know, so they got lawsuits going on. So whatever happens to indigenous people, those who, those are allies who are watching, you're next, you know, we're, we're all connected. We're all from the womb of this mother earth. And, um, you know, I wanna thank all the people that are coming together in a good way. Uh, be sure to visit our, uh, our segments uh, on uh, Life Over Lithium. Uh, the people of Red Mountain that can be found on Standing Bear Network. Uh, all of our uh, educational segments are free for download and distribution for grassroots communities. Um, thank you so much, Max. Thank you, John. I really appreciate you having me on, and and thanks for the kind words. I'm not a saint. I'm not a. <laughs> I'm not particularly special. I'm just a random guy who is worried about these issues like we all should be and decide to do something about it and get up off the couch. So, yeah. um, you know, it's not, it's not about, it's not about me. It's about what we're trying to do. And, and it's about the land and the future. And, and I really appreciate you having me on. This has been a fun conversation and important. You're, you're a beautiful soul. And uh, I want to thank you so much for sharing space there uh, at Pihimaha. Um, I know uh, our people are, 
are, are forever grateful. And uh, hopefully we can uh, talk again soon for an update. Oh, look at the, yeah, the beautiful mountains. Hey, what, what, do, what direction is that? Uh, that's looking east. Looking east. Yeah. Yeah, I, I got to tour that area uh, with Day Henke and uh, a little bit with uh, Gary McKinney. And uh, both are on the, you know, they're part of the people of Red Mountain and uh, they're really doing some amazing, wonderful things. Um, and uh, are there any particular events going on or do you want, is there a call for people to get to the camp? Is there a way for people to support? Well, uh, I would tell people to stay tuned for now because we're not really sure how things are going to work at the moment. Um, the company has put up a gate and started locking and restricting access to the mine site. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, and I'm fighting myself and Will Falk are fighting a $50,000 fine right now that the BLM is trying to pin on us for camping out here, actually basically for creating a, a, a pit toilet for elders to use, you know, people who couldn't use the bathroom just behind a bush. I use uh, that toilet. <laughs> <laughs> the most expensive that's like a gold plated latrine right there that's the most expensive uh, latrine ever built forty nine thousand eight hundred ninety dollars and 13 cents so we're fighting that fine right now um we'll see what happens with this archaeological dig but we want people to stay tuned and really be aware you can check out protectbackerpass.org and sign up for updates yeah. um, and we will keep people posted um, we're on facebook and social media too uh about what's happening out here so um stay tuned be ready and in the meantime these issues are popping up everywhere so uh yeah. get involved in the fight in your area or if nobody else has started already start it yourself thank you well thank send you. all my blessings out to uh my oxam relatives and uh hopefully uh, we'll be able to talk to you uh again in the future maybe to get some updates uh, we send our loving bless, uh, love and blessings here uh, from Standing Bear Network. Uh, and until then, thank everybody for watching and, and please share this out to your groups. Thank you. Oh.